bum, 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 bum. Two episodes in a week. <laughs> Bitches, we're back. We've got a knockoff podcast, episode nine. We've got the Friday edition coming at you. Through down Wednesday, here we are again. You know we're hungry for it. Friday atmosphere is fucking good as ever. I'm joined by my OG originals, Chris and Danny. Yo. What's up, guys? Joined by a guest tonight uh, is Justin. Uh, Justin's driven up from the Gold Coast, had an absolute pain in his balls with the uh, the traffic, but he's made it. He's pain in my anus. He's pain in traffic, just shining once again. Right. Cheers. That, that, Cheers for having me on. That traffic no is an absolute pain in the ass, though. I can remember when I used to live at the Gold Coast at Surfers, and, and just having to commute with that traffic is absolutely brutal. R- regardless of whether you're going down or you're going back, it's just shit everywhere. This is the uh, Traffic and Weather Podcast <laughs> coming to you live from the Julia Street Studios. Yeah, it's so not fun. We've got a sunny 27 today in Brisbane, It was Australia. humid as shit today. There's meant to be storms tomorrow as well, but... Uh, and yeah, look. Storming for the... Uh, What's the game on tonight? Finals, bruh. Finals fever has arrived. It, it feels good. There's so much shit going on. Whether you're an AFL fan, NRL fan, rugby fan. We've got a test match in Brisbane from tomorrow night. We've got the Broncos Titans kicking off the NRL finals tonight live from Suncorp Stadium. Who wins and why, Dan? I reckon the Bronx take it out. I just think... Um, yeah, the, the Titans have had a sketchy season. Like, they got a boost with Hayne, but uh, Broncos have also not had the best season, but they've found some form in uh, in the latter parts of the season, and I think um, I think Bennett's sort of starting to steer them in the right direction for finals. They they always, they always got that experience in the team, you know, so they always, and, and with Bennett there, so I think they'll keep a cool head and get it done. That's it. They seem, Broncos seem to have a bit of a state of origin hangover there after that yeah, finish. There was that yeah. little lull of about four or five weeks, so they really couldn't get their There's shit a certain together. point you've got to stop blaming it, though. Like, no, no, you, <laughs> just get on with the they, season, yeah. And they have, uh, over the last month, they've really turned it on. Like They've beaten, they beat the Storm in Melbourne, in the Storm of Minor Premiers, and you thought, here we go, they're back. So it's one of those things. I, personally, I think they'll get it done tonight and progress into the following week, but straight off the top, I'm excited for the footy, but you know what I'm excited for too is UFC 203 oh Sunday shit. straight out of oh Cleveland. Shit. Yeah, absolutely. That's gonna that's definitely gonna be a big one, man. Like, um, I only actually sort of started familiarising myself with who's on that card today, and it's and badass. It, it, yeah, oh, it, it it, it's legit. Yeah. yeah, it's real legit. I'm going out on a limb straight up. I think we got a new heavyweight champion. I think so as well. I think, I think, uh, it's Alistair's time. The last couple of fights that we've seen him in is just. He's, he's looked in good form, oh, man. Yeah. And he's there. He's he's looks his mental game looks like you know he's well decorated fighter, um, but it looks like he's putting every piece of the puzzle together at the moment. The last couple mm. of fights, he's it looks really exciting. He's looking like a Jackson's fighter. Yeah, for mine, he yeah. really is. I think he's looking like a guy who's under Jackson Winklejohn. For all the casual fans out there, they're two coaches at a gym in Albuquerque that have somewhat just mastered the game. They've had a lot of success, and they could have a new champion in Alistair Overeem. This weekend, I think I think the, the the big factor for me will be whether Alistair can get it done early. Yeah, you know I think I think that Alistair one of the the criticisms that that he's faced in the past is definitely that gas tank, and and certainly he's a you know a real explosive guy over a couple of rounds. But I think that Stipe has shown in many many encounters that that he can definitely go all five and he can do them hard. Yeah. So I watch the um I watch the embedded's and I got a newfound love for Stipe. Eh? He's just like. Proper clown, but he, he is who he is, and he reps it. <laughs> he's with fucking a, funny as shit. With a full time job working as a, a firefighter, and you know, just a down to earth sort of guy. Yeah, you, you gotta true. love that. Yeah, he's not. Time. Yeah, there's no. There doesn't seem to be an ego on the guy, as you say. He gets mm. up. He juggles being UFC world heavyweight champion with working as a firefighter. I'm a world champ. <laughs> I'm world champ. <laughs> I'm the world champ. <laughs> when he knocked out Fabrizio Verdum to win the heavyweight title, I don't think I've ever seen a person full of more, more adrenaline more in, my life. Up in my life. In, yeah. in Brazil, he starched him via KO in the first round fairly early on too. Fabrizio yeah. seemed to just chase him a little bit in that fight and Stipe was good enough to put him away. But for mine, Stipe's fighting at home in Cleveland in his first title defence, that can be a blessing and a curse the sometimes nerves. for fighters. Mm, the uh, nerves, yeah. You're dead right, Justin. Like the, the nervous and the expectation. So it'll be interesting to see if he can, in fact, rise above that. But Alistair Overeem, if we're talking a stand-up fight, this guy is a 
K1 world champion. Yeah. So, mm. Yeah. Mm. They, they, they don't come any more decorated at, at you know, at striking than Alistair over That's it. right. That's We're looking sure. at a... It's, um, it's, it's just as a kind of a side to, to Alistair over him. It's, it's a, he's an interesting case, man, like pre and post uh, testosterone replacement therapy. And you can physically or visually see a difference in his physique. 100%. Noticeably. And uh, he's fucking in better fight form than he's ever been in his life, he has. one he's, would argue. He was... At that time when he fought Brock Lesnar, he was what the the fans labelled Uber Ream, and it was just a mm. two hundred and sixty five pound. Oh man, those fucking knees to the body just after Brock had had stomach surgery. <laughs> after stomach surgery. That was maybe uh, that's up there with one of the like winciest fucking things that I've ever seen on on a UFC card. Yeah, like, surgery oh. was just sitting at home going sweet. I'll see him back here on Monday. Diverticulitis. Mm. Like I think he had nine nine inches of his colon removed or something like that. Like it's a lot of inches. To have <laughs> 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 some inches done. How much is in there? <laughs> <laughs> Man, but he over him has sort of gone in that sort of Lesnar era where he was, you know, horse meated up absolute w- w- fucking wrecking ball freak show he would sort of walk walk people down and just be able to back himself and his chin to slug it out and once he got off that it sort of he'd been clipped a couple of times and his chin had gone yeah what, what they thought was gone but for for mine he seems to be a lot more calculated now very and much so i think so yeah uh, and, and and definitely is is a lot more well-rounded in terms of his takedowns like even if you go back to to the pride alistair over him who, who used to fight it you know who used to fight at 205 pounds for fuck's sake mm. you know i mean his his submitted vitor yeah 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 his his ground game was was pretty much you know like what he used a, a lot you know he's yeah. always been a decorated striker but we we saw that patch that exactly like you said maddie that he went through in the ufc where he was just that stand up guy and then and then guys like travis brown and and guys like bigfoot and all that sort of stuff were clipping him and and rocking him and knocking him out and then he he's morphed into this this new sort of breed of fighter who who like we're seeing from cowboy now is really switching it up you know under greg jackson is is shooting takedowns where people aren't expecting him, and and you know he's taking top position and and is able to inflict a lot of damage from that. that he position. does he does have ground over him. He really he really Absolutely. does. That, that's a valid point to make too. But you know five rounds we'll know as of Sunday. But it's sort of a somewhat of a heavyweight tournament this card as well. You got in the co-main event guys that are backing up coming off losses, and we're talking Fabricio Verdum backing up against Travis Brown coming off an eight-week rest after Kane mm. four weeks mm. ran a train on him at yeah. 200. So yeah. I still think Kane's got to get that next ne- next title shot. You he know? has to. He's waiting in the wings. After that 200 performance of Kane yeah. Velasquez, I think he still reminded people that he's the best heavyweight on yeah, the planet. Yeah, those mm. spinning kicks that he was throwing, I was just like, dude, where are these just, coming from? Just yeah. constant evolution what, with him. Yeah. But um, for mine, i got to pick Fabricio. Shit, could go either way, man. Eh? It's yeah. just like you, you you see a card like this with a lot of heavyweight fighters on it and you're just like, fuck, there could be some real short fights in yeah, this. Because it's just so time. much power involved or it's just yeah. bing, lights out. Right? And let, let's face it, like the heavyweight championship in itself has, has never been defended more than three times. True. So yeah. for, that, right? for that very three fact. Three times is yeah. the most? Yeah, oh, I think Randy Couture holds holds that yeah, record. It, it Isn't it, Briss? Something like that. Absolutely no more than Ma- that. Maybe it's two. Maybe it's two Because anybody can get yeah. caught when yeah. you're talking yeah. that yeah. kind of power. It's like... The, right. the human jaw and brain and all that shit can only take so much force before it's like night S- night. Especially when it's a hundred and twenty kilo mm. individual who's cut to that weight throwing it. That's you exactly see right. Lighter weight guys have seven, eight, nine, ten title defenses. Yeah. Up there at heavyweight, you get hit in the face, you're going out. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, it's, it's exciting as shit to watch. Perfect like way to put it. Exactly. Like everyone everyone loves the heavyweights. They really do. They're sort of Look at the 125 pound division in the UFC now. It's somewhat stagnant with a dominant champion, but when it is changing the, of the guard at, with belts like heavyweight is, the people really fucking get behind it, and it is thoroughly entertaining. Mm, absolutely, but there's a lot of good fights on that card, man. The one, a lot of good fights. <laughs> Justin, I want to, I want to know what your uh, CM Punk. Oh, give man. me, give me a breakdown. I mean. <laughs> Like everyone said, you've you've got to give it to the guy for for getting in there. Can you um, e- explain to the listeners what sort of who he is and how he's coming onto the scene? The WWE. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't. I've never. Fo- I, to be honest, um, when we, I still remember the card that we were watching, the Conor McGregor card when he fought Dustin Poirier when they announced that big announcement. Oh, we're signing CM Punk, and I was like, I mean, I know the two Stewie boys knew who he was because of you know 
old school WWE fans, but I was like, who's this guy? Like CM Punk, I saw all the tattoos and I was like, oh, I, you know, he must have done a bit of mixed martial arts before and he's, you know, this before. Dude's, this dude's got a Pepsi tattoo on his yeah. neck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually crazy though. Like, um, I guess it's, it's fucking definitely not as popular in Australia, but that WWE shit in the States, man. It's big time, Ridiculous, hey. bro. Massive money the, business. They like, don't understand it. They'll enormous. Get, they'll, they'll get 110,000 to, to WrestleManias, mm. you know? Because it's, inter- wow. it's entertainment for kids is what it is. So the reason that, um, you know, that Chris and I have had, have had an interest in it is because we used to hire the videos when we were like yeah. s- seven and six years old and stuff like that. And it's all the spectacle and the fanfare and it's entertainment. It's not oh, necessarily definitely. sport. Like, I mean, I guess in the same way that bodybuilding is a sport, if you want to, if you want to go down that road, but it's not really, it's, it's, not it's, it's yeah, it's well, just it's for <laughs> something else. It's not a sport. Bodybuilding no. isn't a sport. No. It, no. Well, they will call it a sport and they'll like, I've got a competition coming up. Like, mm. If yeah. if you talk to a bodybuilder, they would argue that it's a sport. I don't think they would. I yeah, I guess a lot of a lot of them do. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot a lot of them do. But CM Punk ain't no bodybuilder. He's a, he's an entertainer. Yeah, he's coming a WWE megastar through theatrical sport compared to getting into a mixed martial arts fight in the cage. He has no for the fans out there who don't know who CM Punk is. He doesn't have in mixed martial arts world. He doesn't have any experience at all. This is. No. Quite literally, at 37 years old, his first fight. He doesn't have a collegiate background in wrestling, or he doesn't have a boxing career that he's sort of got to fall back on. Nothing. So it's going to be interesting to see Zero. what an average Joe, as such, off the street. Like, not saying he's not an athletic guy, but he is just walking in raw dog off the street as a white belt and everything. How much evolution he can make in two years under. And elite coaching I and at 37 as well man that's that's the big thing fighting that I was, a 24 I was, year old yeah, yeah. I was Who? listening to a podcast this afternoon and they were talking about the fact that you know being a martial artist there's always like accumulated injuries and, and you're going to be banged 100%. up no, no matter what you know and you're talking about a guy who's suffered the same injuries arguably in fucking WWE and that shit that they do like jumping off top ropes and fucking ladders and all that sort of shit you're still getting injured doing that shit yeah and uh, and it takes a toll on the body. And for him to, you know, then transition to this mixed martial arts career as a 37-year-old, and you saw on that um, the Evolution of Punk series that's, like, meant to hype his fight up, uh, he, he fucking had to have sh- shoulder surgery, like, halfway through this two-year preparation and stuff like that. Like, to be got honest, a, got a proper was, injury. I think that was a little bit of a godsend for him. Um, I think if he had fought, like, within that first year, it would have been, like, oh man, what have I got myself into? But mm. with a bit of reassessment and time under uh, Duke Rufus that, you know, the expertise under him, who's also Anthony Pettis' coach, the ex-lightweight light lightweight champion, he's really put him in perspective and said, like, look, this is a, I'm not going to let you fight for another year. Like, has told him, like, we're going to be covering at least these, these bases. And he's, I can give him this, man, he's become a student. Like, you see him on those, the YouTube clips, like, helping guys wipe, uh, wipe the mats. And he's like, he doesn't think he's above anyone because of his uh, popularity. He's really trying to, you know. He definitely comes across as a super down-to-earth character. Yeah, like. he really does. And it would sort and of you, be... You would have to be humbled going into that. You oh, know? yeah. Be- because he's going in and getting his ass kicked every day. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's hard, it's hard yeah, to... Yeah, he knows yeah. he's at the bottom yeah. of the ladder. <laughs> That's yeah. right. If, if, if Walking Pettis- in there shouting his own name and shit. Like, <laughs> 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 so you're not going to last long. His opponent for this is uh, Mickey Gall. And look, he's a 2-0 and o professional record but he is a brown belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu under the miller brothers like both of them got highly credentialed black belts in the ufc plenty of experience for both of those guys so he's had elite coaching for a hell of a long time and his grappling is no joke too he just um he went uh to points with gordon ryan who's just the who's the ebi middleweight champion at the moment or what or was um, so he's under John Danaher as well, like a really like world level guy, and went to points with him. Neither of them could submit each other. So, wow, well, yeah, so the the, lo- the level of his grappling, at least, and you saw in that first fight that he yeah. had the guy that he submitted yeah. in like a minute or Michael something. Michael Jackson. Yeah, Michael Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Some mm. old nah, moon walk all your ass, man. Yeah. <laughs> but but you, you can understand when you when you watch how guys roll and you watch how guys move and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and you do. You watch that initial fight that he had with Michael Jackson and you watch how slickly some people take the back and, and how Just some people roll. Just the transitions, yeah. The transitions. And, and you know that what level people are at, you know? Yeah. And, and he's definitely legit on the ground, you know? And throws bombs as well. Let's, so. let's go on record. Uh, does... Mickey Gall win and yeah. does CM Punk get out of the first round? Are you going to put your balls on the line with an outrageous suggestion uh, now that well, you're uh, you're two yeah, and I'm, yeah yeah I'm t- <laughs> t- two and O going into this, listeners? As you know, like no call need. it by Darce choke at oh. a minute fifty five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he'll it'll be I'm toe a, hole. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a platter. Like yeah. call the combination that it Gaul, ends with. it'll yeah. be body body head. Yeah, Gore will get badly badly hurt, and then we'll just pull out a uh, a flying triangle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like fucking historic. But no, I, sports I'm, almanac. I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna go on the record here. This is for me to go for the hat trick. I'm fucking putting my nutsack out on the uh, on the laptop in front of me. Yeah, man, uh, put that shit away. That's Mi- fucking Mickey Gore. Yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Need to get some hair removal yeah. cream on yeah, that yeah, beanbag, yeah. mate. You cleaned that rash up a little <laughs> bit too. Nuts, anyway. mate. Yeah. What, what do you reckon this is? <laughs> <laughs> mate, it feels uh, yeah. feels uh, hard. Yeah. It's, almost, yeah. it's almost furish. Like it's um, Mickey Gould chokes him out by a rear naked choke inside the first three minutes. That's I think that's very shit. Wow. Shit. Yeah. 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 I'll go on record and say that. Man, I got to I got to be honest. Like I don't, you know, profess to know the ins and outs of martial arts and what, what defines a good martial artist by watching the tape in the gym and stuff like that. Yeah. But watching CM Punk in his, in his promo videos leading up, like it looks like I'm in there trying to, trying to learn. Basically. I think they would have kept a <laughs> lot that's of not things. A compliment. I think they would have kept a lot of things close to heart coming up to it. Like you're right. When you're was right. the last time? Like if you, when, I think I watched the first two of those CM videos and, they were from like early 2015. So yeah, yeah. if if he, he you, I mean, if yeah. you have the time and the money to pay, do you know, work with Duke Rufus every day for a year, you're gonna improve, man. And he's a dedicated guy. So I think his skill level is definitely gonna be, and they're gonna have a good game plan to go in there with. Like, don't go in there and try and knock him out in the first round. Like, it's gonna be a humiliation if he gets. Punk. Done in the first round. If he gets punked in the first in the yeah, first yeah, round. Yeah. CM CM Punk. Showtime kick knockout, like mm. just off the cage, like not, not Anthony happen, Pettis, yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. But Pro- no. problem is, I guess with with game plans with someone who has zero amateur fights and zero professional fights and all that sort of stuff is, it would be extremely tricky for a martial artist to stick to a game plan when they've never followed a game plan. One hundred percent. So they've never, like, they've never known what it's like to be to be clipped and hurt or be, to be taken down and being controlled and 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 all those sort of different dynamics that a fight can potentially take you to um, and, and then obviously you've got to react in that situation because you can't draw on any previous experience that you've had from from being in that situation. Yeah, right. You it's know a, what's another interesting angle to think about it though is that um, CM Punk coming from the WWE background is more than comfortable performing spotlight. in front of a giant fucking yeah, audience. Sure. That is one Mickey thing. Gall, yeah. has he performed under the big lights yet? Yeah. Uh, only on the on the one card that he that he fought Jackson on and that was on the first That's right. Th- was on Fight Pass. So it wouldn't have yeah. been a capacity building at It would have been time, like yeah get out there kid like would they th- do you reckon fighters like on the undercard would get to choose their music still and stuff? Yeah, or they yeah. Just yeah. Most, most oh, of course. Yeah, they, they would, but um, in terms of the crowd, the American crowd arrive around main card time. It yeah, progressively you, fills up. Where mm. if, like, yeah, everybody's out having a beer in the fucking right, garden. Yeah, in yeah. the casino and all that, that type of thing. But um, yeah, I can't, I can't help but think um, Mickey, Mickey gets it done. Like, yeah. I think that, that, that is something that I... A lot of people do look look past is the the spotlight. Once you walk out there, and you are in front of that other person, and everyone's out of the cage, the cameras are gone, and it's like, yeah, Doosh, fuck. All right, we're here. This is about to happen. Who's to say that Mickey Gall doesn't drop the ball mm. and mm. make a mm. silly mistake? It's it happens. It it that's the beauty of fighting, and you guys have said it before. Of you know, anything can happen, and yeah. if you make one mistake, man. It doesn't matter if the guy's had 10 years experience yep. or one year experience. If he throws a punch and gets lucky, you could, you could go out. Mm-hmm. And that could, you know, that could happen. From a marketing point of view, they copped a lot of heat when they first signed him. Like, guy with a zero record is just walking straight into the UFC. But 
of all the fights we've touched on, we've got a UFC heavyweight title fight. You can almost break this one down the most because it's got the most intriguing questions. So yeah, they've brought in, a, brought in a celebrity that's doing it and he's got that draw power from the casual fan as well. So and, I and say hats off to him. And <laughs> let's be honest, man. That's, that's honestly why you become a fan of an organization is because of their entertainment value. Yeah. And, and the UFC has everybody hooked with these embedded series, with the, you know, the extracurricular media that they put out um, versus... Bellator, you might if you're up late on a Friday night and it's on it's on TV, you might watch a couple of fights on Bellator or if mm. you know MVPs fighting or something like. I think it's a different sort of freak fight, but it seems like the more marketability type of fight. Where Bellator over there, they're doing the Hoist Gracie versus Frank mm. Seven and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> like over there, it feels like they've fought for so many fucking times those guys. But and this one's a a different way of doing it, but. Equally as successful, and and not to get off track in the slightest. But now that now that Bellator have signed Rory, you mentioned MVP, MVP versus Rory McDonald. That's ne- a big fucking needs, fight. Needs to fucking happen. Michael Van and Page. They, they absolutely need to do that fight. That M- uh, MVP. I, I've been, you know, not to sort of toot my own horn here, but I've been fucking rapping that dude for years now. You know, like is he, he the is, current champion over there? No, no, no. He, he's definitely not. He's riding a, a, a five or a six fight win streak. I think his now. last the that his beat last Benson. fight was dev- like a devastating yeah. performance. He he beat Caved in Cyborg. Oh, Cyborg. Cyborg. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, explain that to, to people who haven't listened yeah, if they so can find it online. A, or anybody who hasn't seen that, there's a uh, there's, there's a guy who uh, who there's another lady who's fighting in the UFC called Cyborg who uh, who actually used to be partners with this Cyborg just to confuse the living fuck out of you. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, hey, honey. Cy- hey, honey. Hey, yeah. Cyborg. Hey, yeah. Cyborg. Yeah. Hey, honey. Yeah. Hey, honey. Hey, honey. Hey, honey. Let's fuck hear a me, nickname. Cyborg. <laughs> Let's fucking nickname. you cyborg but um but yeah so anyway uh MV- mvp caught, caught him with a flying knee and absolutely caved in his his skull to the point where it had to get reconstructed his his forehead looked like he'd been hit really hard in the face with a baseball and it's, it's quite legit. literally caved it was his probably head. one of the most sickening injuries oh. that i've ever seen and the most gross thing about it was the x-ray like the mri scan that you saw his forehead skull had just been caved in in the shape of a knee it was just fucking yeah, I showed, terrifying. I showed my girlfriend and like, as you know, she works in the emergency department and she was like, is he dead? Mm. Like she thought he was dead. Yeah. 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 Wow. You know, that's... Because that potential right there, basically I'd read a report that his injury was like being in a severe car accident. Yeah. Like if you had to hit, oh. your, hit, hit oh. your head on oh, the windshield some, or the steering well, wheel. He's coming in for a takedown and just perfect timing from MVP just to land that knee at the right time. And you, you hear it with in real time, the actual video of it happening and it just makes you cringe. Is he going to fight again, Cyborg? Oh, he said that he wanted to turn around inside six months, but like, you think he's just saying that that's, his, pro- that's his pride as a warrior going out and doing it. But please don't. That. Please, yeah. don't. Yeah. please don't. He's a, bit of a, journey. He's a complete journeyman. You're dead right. He's had a history in Strike Force, like one of mm. the older organisations that's not around anymore. But if you're his family, you're getting in his ear surely and saying, yeah, hey, look, mate, you've, you've done us incredibly proud. You've had a distinguished career yeah that's enough mm. and yeah. i also read about rory during the week too that um that he's gone that avenue of uh of compl- like a lot of fighters are actually going the avenue of these days is um giving away hard sparring indefinitely like cowboy it, said that yeah. in his uh last interview with joe rogan he's yeah, like I, right. don't, I don't spar at all anymore. yeah yeah do, exactly do you think that uh it the first guy recently that has sort of confessed to giving away the hard sparring was robbie lawler Mm-hmm. And I think he was almost somewhat of a fucking renaissance man. Yep. He had a, like, revived his career. He's only recently lost his belt, but he got involved in some of these absolute classics and was able to get his chin tagged so many times and not go to sleep yep. in these wars. And he's given up the sparring, so he's not getting hit at training. He's only getting hit in the cage. And mm. and, and it, uh, you can understand there's, there's definitely method behind that madness, you know, because even if you... I mean, it, it, it's definitely been documented a whole bunch of times on, on the commentary side of things. But, you know, if you go back to... You, you look at the, the shooter boxes and, and all that sort of stuff back in the, the Vandalay Silver, the, the Shogun era, all that sort of stuff... Apparently, if you listen to people who were in those gyms, they were fucking wars. Yeah. Fighting like, in the gym every yeah, day. Like, yeah. Yeah, Literally just go. fights. Yeah. Like, just throw down. No, no weigh-ins. Like, I weigh 212 today. I weigh 218. No headgear. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, and, and there's an account <laughs> for that. Do you know, that there's a, a, a bank balance that, that, that definitely gets depleted in terms of your chin and in terms of your, you know, your career longevity. For shout, sure. out, shout out there. We just mentioned the axe murderer. Shout out to... Uh, 
Vandalay, the axe murderer Silver. Mm. Maybe one of the scariest men on the planet. If you if you saw this guy in a dark alley and he asked for your wallet, you're going to give it to him. <laughs> I tell you, and I then, find and everything else. And he op- was he was. I had the pleasure of meeting him in the McCarran Airport in Las Vegas. That's and, right. And. Uh, he was an absolute gentleman. I remember we came up, came up the escalator, like flying out. I'd just been in Vegas with my parents of all people, and uh, they're doing some travel around the, at the time. So I went and met them in Las Vegas. Walking up, the, go up the escalator, go in. I thought, oh, I've got some time to kill. I'll go buy a magazine or something just to read in the lounge. Walk up and I see a guy just reading magazines. Come up from behind him, and Vandalay has this really distinguishable tribal tattoo on the back of his bald head that is just straight <laughs> caveman spec. Mm. Just put like, your hand on his like, ass cheek. Like that, that, <laughs> yeah. So I go up, uh, suck, F- and F- fondle his yeah. gooch, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and just sucked his earlobe. <laughs> How quickly no, do you reckon you'd I be s- asleep? I see this, I see oh, this tattoo one, on the one back one of shot. Yeah, I don't reckon you'd actually get lips to lips to load. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you'd absolutely. get close and he'd feel your breath, Fuck and no. then he'd just turn around and spit oh, back man. elbow. You he wouldn't even off. know what happened. You'd be like, "Fuck!" What you happened? Just see the reaction. Tried to me, suck on Vandalay's ear like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the Vegas airport. You'd be all over the MMA forums and yeah. nothing <laughs> else. But uh, you'd, all, you'd also be some up on fucking a, dickhead fan today. <laughs> you'd be on a manslaughter <laughs> charge at the same time. Like I didn't mean to kill him, but he killed me. But he, I end up so I see walking up to the magazines and this guy with a big bald head with this tattoo. I thought. That can only be one person in this town, Las Vegas fight capital of the world. Lo and behold, it was, and he just sort of, I just sort of parked myself a couple of feet away from him, waited for him to turn around, and just sort of locked eyes with him. I just went, Vandalay Silver, sort of put my hands together like I was praying almost. He's completely, <laughs> st- completely starstruck he's, as, he's a, as a Brazilian. Yeah, He'll understand. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Like, and, he loves God. And yeah. we knelt down and prayed together. <laughs> no. So it ended up, long story short, just ended up having a conversation with the guy and just an out and out gentleman. And mm. you can tell that's a thing with, he's a martial artist mm. as well, where he can go in and just let it all hang out and just get in these absolute wars and he's known for being one of the most violent fighters to mm. ever lace up a, a glove. And it's just a gentleman behind closed doors. So oh. just yeah. sh- well, when shout you, out. Yeah, you get to that level and it's controlled violence, isn't it? It's... um. It's like a profession for these guys, so it's it's not necessarily something that's so aggressive for them. So they don't need to be a fucking psycho at the it, pub or th- completely unapproachable. Mm, yeah, they, yeah, have, oh, they have that release, you know. Like they're yeah. they're sparring and they're getting that 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 like innate human desire to like be violent mm. out in a in a setting where it's it's safe and then and glorified know, and, and glorified Woo! Yeah. <laughs> get him knocked his ass out get him yeah, yeah. starched him <laughs> yeah i guess that's where the um the line between the sort of purest martial artist philosophy or standpoint mixes with a big business shit like ufc and it's sort of you know a few of those martial arts values you would argue kind of Kind of go by the way. So just head butted the fucking <laughs> microphone there. Sorry if that if you're in noise oh. ca- noise cancelling headphones and just hear this dunk. <laughs> just my headphone on the mic. Just Brycey getting his innate human aggression out <laughs> against the microphone. Talking it about Vandalay, the blood's pumping. It, d- it definitely depends on the ter- type of fighter it is too, though. You know, I think that if you get a goal, yeah. if you get a goal like Vandalay, and and certainly it's been a tr- talked about before that. There's certain fighters that you can watch. That, Bite down that, on your mouth guard. And yeah, throw and, he, and he is that guy. You know, Shout you, you, out you, Max go, you go back and and you, yeah, yeah, and you watch. You know the that was his, his pride fights and, and and even anybody who wants a, a really good fight to watch of of Vandalay's is is go back and watch his fucking fight with Chuck in the cool. UFC, which is just an absolute brawl of dudes standing a fist fight in a phone booth of guys just unloading. Who both have knockout power, but neither one went out. It like was, they went all three. That was criminal. That that fight happened at that time where non-title fight main events were three rounds. Yeah, yeah, those, definitely. Those two let it all hang out for fifteen minutes, and there was potential for that to go twenty-five. Oh, like, absolutely! Imagine throwing another ten minutes yeah. into that brawl, and, but an instant classic. And and that was the absolute, you know, the the glory fight of the time, you know, because that there was obviously the that Pride error of they had just bought Vandalay over from Pride into the UFC, and it was sort of like you know, pro, like Vandalay left Pride as the champion, Chuck was the champion of the UFC, and they had finally had the two top dogs that were getting pitted off against each other, you know, and and they 
didn't disappoint. You no, know, like they absolutely threw down. Who's the down toughest kid in the schoolyard? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And two hundred five was a, such a blue ribbon weight class at that point in time. You know what I mean? Now, now it's look the I'm top. Going to say that the, the athletes are probably better. Like some of the two hundred fivers that we have now would run a train on some of those guys from that era. I dare say, in terms of the imagine a Alexander Gustafsson versus Chuck Liddell. Like that, that's, that's a, a different that, fight these a, days. Absolutely, yeah. Like, but say like prime both guys, like the Gustafsson at Fort Jones versus the Chuck that. Well, wasn't beat Chuck, Randy Chuck Liddell was all over social media not long ago saying he would knock John Jones out? Yeah, and I, I was know, like, mm. that, that, that they've a, had beef for ages. They, they, have, they really yeah. have had beef for ages. Obviously, Chuck doesn't. It, it's well documented that Chuck doesn't like John Jones and yeah. and has he talked must, a shitload of smack. He must about rub him. rub each other up the wrong way, or he said something behind closed doors that sort of baited him, but. We're here hooking into the martial arts chat and our guest tonight, Justin, is sort of started his own martial arts journey and he's passionate. When he gets into things, he's passionate about it and he seems to really fall in love with jiu-jitsu. Love it, yeah. Um, training out of the Gold Coast? Yeah, training under uh, Axis, under uh, Jason Robig at Axis Jiu-Jitsu down the coast. Um, and uh, won yourself the uh, the featherweight... Uh, is it is it like do they do it in belts? So is that the featherweight white belt? Featherweight title? white belt, yep. Sick. Uh, just, uh, just went to Japan and competed at the Hicks and Gracie Cup. So we went over there as a team, just with the academy, and uh, competed over there. And yeah, it was uh, the biggest stage I've ever sort of been mm. on, and it was really exciting. Really, uh, definitely a, a, a an exciting moment in my life that. You know, I'll definitely never forget and definitely want to go back and has sort of sparked me to, to want to keep going with it. So you say you are training under the tutelage of black belt Jason Robig. Yes. For people at home that don't know him, in terms of Australian circles, he is just a super high credentialed black belt. Is that, is that right? He, he, is, um, he has a black belt under Hickson and Cron Gracie, who uh, if, if you know the Gracie family, a lot there's a lot of sort of the grandfather of, of jiu-jitsu is Helio Gracie and his sons, he had nine sons. Mm. The youngest, oh. I think one of the youngest... Couldn't miss. Strong yeah. <laughs> seed. <laughs> strong fucking seed. Good Brazilian seed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, strong. So he had nine sons, taught them all uh, jiu-jitsu and that is named, that, that is like called Gracie jiu That's where Gracie jiu-jitsu comes from. Hoist Gracie was like basically in the family called the runt of the family and he was the one that they chose to put into the UFC. Horion Gracie was their, one of their brothers who started the UFC and a- actually sold it on to the Fatitas. Oh, right. So the, they, they said the champion of the family, you know, in the small circles, this is what I've heard from Jason, is that Hickson was the champion of the family. He would sort of like tap Hoist with one hand tied behind his back, you know, easily. Jeez. Because the reason why they chose actually Hoist to go into the UFC was because he wasn't a big you know, athletic looking guy. He was a sort of unassuming guy and they wanted to show jujitsu in its technique, like in its, um, like for how technical it was, not for how like you could just overwhelm a guy. Mm. Um, yeah, let's, and let's send this 75 kilo guy in and just ex- watch him wreck shop. Yeah, Did he fight like Bob, Bob Sapp or am I imagining nah, that? that? No, not, f- at, not at UFC he 1. He fought no. some fucking giant dudes though, man. Big, no weight, no big, weight big divisions. Guys. Yeah, no weight divisions and guys wearing one boxing gloves and like... Yeah. Uh, Jimison. Uh, yeah. yeah, in, the, in yeah. the one boxing glove yeah. you had the, Royce the karate versus, kid uh, there. Royce uh, Kimo. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's fucking the, good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. So they sent Hoist in as the 75 kilo guy just to wreck shop when there's eight other brothers basically in the family that yeah, could and run that, a train on him. And you and you would you might have heard of like Henzo Gracie Academy in New York who like who are who GSP, Chris Wildman are under. So they're all the, the brothers and, and and then it sort of trickles down and then you, you, you get like people under under those guys and then black belts under those guys. But we're really lucky here in Australia. Well, I'm really lucky and everyone sort of on the Gold Coast that trains at Access under Jason is that he's Australia's only Hickson Gracie black belt and to have a black belt under Hickson who's like widely regarded as like the Yoda mm. the, the man you know that guys look to he he has this thing called invi- Tor- Vitor Belfort in, invisible jiu-jitsu which is like the way Jason describes it is 
you know, a, a lot of these guys have techniques and it's like plugging, a, you know, if you have a technique, it's like plugging something into a, a, a wall socket. But what Hickson has is like the 240 volts behind the behind the wall, you know, that, that actually powers everything. So without what he has, a technique is only a technique and some guy might come up with something else that can defeat that technique. But he uses like a, the thing he calls it is connection. So connection to the ground. The ground never moves. So if you're connected to the ground you have the power of the ground and it's I, I definitely don't do it any justice explaining it because you know I'm only a white belt I've only been training for under Jason for a year but that's the kind of the beauty that I see when I roll with guys from other clubs and other gyms who are bl blue and purple belts and they're you know they're making comments like man how long have you been training like what what you know you've you've definitely been doing this for way longer and I I've f like fell in love with it because it was something that I always thought that I was an athletic kind of person. Like I had eight years of gymnastics behind me um, through school and did a bit of Muay Thai kickboxing and then thought, oh yeah, my f I want to try Jiu-Jitsu. Like it was actually, I have to give credit to you guys. I remember uh, UFC 121, was it uh, Kane versus Brock? Ooh, Came down yeah. and watched it at your place, Chris. Down the Gold Coast, and I remember just it well. You did right, it was. How was the traffic that day, mate? Was it yeah. horrendous? <laughs> <or>? <laughs> Let's get back to the traffic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but actually that seeing that sparked my like curiosity of like like what is this like mm. wrestling and like you know, I always had this like wanted to be the sort of who could be the toughest guy in the playground sort of thing. I think that's in everyone and Oh, I loved gymnastics going through school, but I always wanted to do martial arts. And I think after school finished and I stopped training in gymnastics and I started working all the time and I was like, you know what, I want to, I want to pick something back up again. So I started doing a little bit of Muay Thai. I love that. Um, but just, you know, just with work and everything. And then as soon as I found jujitsu, I was just like, this is, it's just, I don't know. I just can't explain it. It's yeah. Just, it's you know, it, it, it seems like it's, um, there's, there's such an in-depth world in it. And, uh, and just for, for people listening's reference, uh, a couple of days before this podcast, Justin actually sent me a YouTube video, um, of John Danaher, which is, um, a, a really famous, uh, jujitsu practitioner and has worked with the likes of you know gsp and um matt sarah and all these guys who are sort of super high level guys yeah. and they all speak his praises to the nth degree but to hear his um his description of basically like if you've got it's like it's like problem solving is what is what it constantly is and and most problem solving and he describes it like if you've got you know a simple math problem that's like 752 divided by 13 that's a static problem that's you know you you do the math you write, write the sums down to figure it out whereas jiu jitsu is is problem solving and it's a dynamic problem so whatever you're doing to solve the problem the problem is forever changing and it's dynamic and it's like to hear you sort of talk about you know these guys you know like for for my reference watching somebody like Yois Gracie is like holy shit how did that guy do that and then to think he's got eight other brothers that can fucking like have their way with him and he's the runt of the family is fascinating to think that there's these guys out there who are so in depth in all of those techniques and have dedicated essentially their entire lives to this thing and it's just you know still um there's still enough in it that it's like it holds their interest for that that, that period of their lifetime where you know and they and they get this yoda status from people so jason's the the black belt down there have you obviously he's in there teaching and mentoring do you get to roll with him as well uh, he's he's very select. Uh, I mean, he does roll occasionally. Um, he is nursing a few a few injuries that he still has from his younger years. Um, but he mainly will like when he's teaching a class. Like obviously, when we're just doing a class, he will be the instructor. So he will sometimes when we roll at the end, he'll you know be like, oh, you know, pick people out, and I've rolled with him twice mm -hmm. in the year and four months that I've been training. And every time you're like. It's just a puzzle, man. It's like, okay. He, he, he Sometimes he even will like, he has a favorite choke that he does. And you're like, I know he's going to do that. And you can do everything you want to try and defend that. But he's still just like, 
lands yeah. it. it. Just yeah, it, it it's crazy, man. Make, it just makes it feel like it's your first day. Yeah, yeah. but uh, to go back to your point, like no, he he will what he will so he'll show the we'll do like an hour of technique. Uh, like we'll, we'll warm up for 15 minutes. We'll do you know 45 to an hour of technique, and then he'll. Uh, we'll roll for half an hour and he will walk through the room and sort of like watch people and sort of pick people up on things and you know you know you, if you could have done this um you know just so he'll he's always watching and he he's always you know there to give you your pointers which is what you want you don't want a guy that is still like com- trying to compete at the the highest level and still worried about his own sort of training regime and he he's he's definitely like a sort of older wiser you know Ma- that's why they call him yeah. professors man because yeah. you know he's he's been training this i think he started in 2001 he started in bjj uh he's got a, a, another martial arts back, background but um and so you mentioned that you you tried your hand at, at, at muay thai was the the sort of first point of call and and then you sort of found jiu-jitsu and do you find that there's um limitation in, in a striking discipline versus what there's available in a jiu-jitsu or you think it's just some people gravitate towards different things and and jiu-jitsu just happens to be your kick or uh, what, definitely what's different different strokes for different folks um but i just like that you can go 100 percent in training at jiu-jitsu and you're not going to knock someone out or yeah. you're not going to lose your teeth or you're yeah. not going to you know get concussed or if someone's got your arm and it's about to break, you tap and that's it. And then yeah. no one's hurt. There's no, like, there's obviously just, it's a physical activity. So there is still some, you know, injuries at, at times. And, mm. but kickboxing is just a, it's, I find it very ego driven. You know, you get it in, you, you, you tag someone once, even if you know, like, we're just going to go light. It's like, oh, you got me. You know, I don't want to leave this round knowing that you got the upper hand it's kind of like tit for tat and then before you know it you're both slugging out and then does that still exist somewhat in jiu-jitsu or can it um i mean i've only ever trained at axis um i think it would definitely especially if you go yeah. back to like brazil and stuff there'd be, yeah there'd be a, if you coming into the gym and start doing okay against husama Palharis. he might uh he might get a little bit <laughs> fired up just like, <laughs> watch your take legs. one of your knees home with him like <laughs> That's there would have to be in, across other gyms that people that are like, man, I don't like rolling with that guy. Like it's, too, it's too competitive. Like we're here just getting flow, and by the sounds of Axis, it's good that people do leave the ego at the door. And it's I think very that's, that's that's based from the professor as well. Hundred percent right? filters yeah, down. Yeah, he's very relaxed guy. Like you know, if you ever met him, like he's not. You know, you see most um, like jujitsu guys and their f- cauliflower ears. Like he's barely got a little bit of cauliflower ear and super nice guy he's always surfing you know he's always out with his paddleboard or surfboard and if you met him and didn't know that he was a badass you wouldn't you would never assume it you know he's a super friendly guy he's always got a smile on his face and that's terrifying that, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that give, him, like, give him a spray in traffic because he didn't move quick enough on the, exactly. uh, on the <laughs> green light like, it, like wrong move buddy <laughs> cut you off in a parking lot just get out like yeah i'm gonna smash this guy out. isn't isn't that funny though like how outrageous people can get when they're in their cars versus if you were just walking down the street and somebody cut in front of you on the street and you just went from zero to absolute psychopath as quickly as people do when they feel protected by their cars. So you've got a ton and a half vehicle and you can just accelerate <laughs> yeah. zero to 104 seconds. In the in. opposite direction, like to get away. So even women start flipping off and stuff <laughs> in cars, like at men and it's like... Oh, you see that footage all the time. They show it on the TV, but it's all over YouTube and stuff it. like that. Crazy yeah. road rage incidents. There was that guy like uh, a few months back that had some altercation with a truck driver and then they've both antagonized each other on the road for like mm. a good fucking 10 10 15 kilometers pulled over onto a median strip in the middle of the highway and start bluing will like maybe thrown thrown a haymaker and and a push but the guy one of the guys got pushed into the oncoming traffic oh, 110 k's an hour and, and was killed that's it. Over someone cutting you off, oh, just it's t- not t- worth it. Eh? Take no. a take a deep breath, like and that's and that's when you know you talk about that controlled aggression and these people that have this this prime primal instinct that they need to release, and put it into something like martial arts. If if you're that sort of way inclined, before you you know you find yourself just fucking raging out on the highway because somebody did something to you in traffic it's definitely calm me down like and i think yeah. it's necessary man for for people that have like i mean there's people out there that just like they're just chilled from the get-go like, they don't need that but some people need a little bit of a harness and i think martial arts and you know for me jiu-jitsu provides that 
like little channel. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's what I love about it the most because you can go in there, you can put a hundred percent effort in, um, and feel like you're progressing and get that little bit of like adrenaline or endorphins or whatever, and then leave there and not have any any of this pent up aggression or pent up you know anxiety or whatever. Or a concussion. Or, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Going into, the, into that Muay Thai gym, throwing down yeah. with, a, with, a, with a training partner where you're both still learning the ropes. Your sparring partner's had a shitty afternoon at work. He's had a blue <laughs> with his missus. He's just there throwing down. You're both in the pocket. We're here. It's You got me. Double tap. Yeah. We'll let it go and we'll yeah, start again. It. Like yep. it, it must be... Um, do you remember your first day in the gym? Did they, we, they just cut through you like a knife through butter? Did you just get... Submitted yeah. constantly because <laughs> like, I hear people say that too. Where you know you start jujitsu and you go in there and you're literally on the ground floor. And as you say, with people without egos, it seems to be a bit of a no dickhead policy in jujitsu because people everybody go, just seems to you like yeah. Damien Meyer at that point. Exactly, yeah, yeah exactly right. Because yeah. pe- people go in with an ego and they can't handle getting choked out or tapped just constantly. Like, no, fuck this. Yeah, there's well, there's definitely those guys that come in and they still come in all the time. Um, you'll see them they'll come in for like five or six lessons and then you'll never see them again. They, yeah. you know, sort of bigger guys like come from footy, maybe done a bit of rugby and they think, you know, the, the, the tackling side of it is going to translate. And it does definitely. If you get, if you're standing in front of someone and you get that situation, the bigger guy is always going to get the smaller guy down. But if you're technical and you know, and you feel comfortable on the bottom with some big guy and you know, like, Hey, I'm safe here. Like, and you have the right pathway to the victory then then you're not going to panic and he's going to burn himself out in four to five minutes and just be like, what? And f- at that stage, after you're like, if you've got 20 or 30 kilos on a guy and and you're like, go into that scenario thinking, I'm going to dominate this person and then turn around and he's on your back choking you out in four minutes. You're like, what the hell, man? Like, And that, it's, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Definitely. Yeah. So do, do you still go in there like, white belt status you've done 12 months experience is there other people there in higher belts that you can that still tap you and you like you can see like oh that guy's a brown belt geez he, he's good like does that happen a lot um def- do, you, do def- you tend to roll with your same so, sorry to cut you off, do you tend to roll with the white belts with the white belts the no no belts like the the, belts, there's or? there's a like a definitely an older generation at the gym who are there's a few like like brown belts there who have been you know there for a long time and and they're there to learn just as much as we are. Just, you know, they're still on their journey. And even Jason says he's still on his journey. He still gets surprised every day by the things that he learns. So there's, I think it's that never ending like humbleness where you see guys come in and, and I've done it now, like being a year into my journey, you, you see guys come in on their first day and you remember what you were like and you're like, oh, okay. Like, and you try and, you know, help the guy out because you want to, you want good guys to to be training with you you want guys to test your limits so if you're all building each other up and testing each other you get better as a as a as a group and as a family and that's it it feels like that you know like oh we when you have that role with a guy who's never done anything and you show him a few things and then he uses it and then you're like yeah sweet that's like almost more of a victory than getting a submission for for me anyway like i feel like that is translating transferring that knowledge is is like you get that that little victory and then the, the older guys get that, give that to you. And, mm. and it becomes like a team sport in that sense as well, you yeah. know? And it's like any anybody who's competed in both, you know, uh, not even professional, but just, you know, like organized um, individual sports or team sports, you'll find it hard to argue that anybody will say that training and things like that are better for an individual sport. You give me laps up and down a pool versus throwing the footy around with, 15, 17 other, yeah, you, other dudes in, build that on a field. Different different box of frogs altogether. Definitely like but gang, um, gang bangs off the field together like that brotherhood <laughs> sort of thing. Like well, yeah, I, like allegedly. I just listen to that, um, the podcast you did with Drew and that was, you know, hearing him talk about flying all over Dr- the world. Drew Mitchell, ladies and gentlemen, for anybody, uh, that was uh, episode eight and uh, he's a uh, Wallabies legend. So check that shit out. Yeah, definitely. It was a good one. It was a really good podcast. Um, fucking damn right hearing him t- <laughs> hearing him talking about that fucking killed. 
hearing him talk about the the camaraderie and traveling around the world and having that you know brotherhood is is you know that sort of like it's home. a beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing uh ladies and gentlemen we're just going to take a brief interlude we will be right back and i believe we're back and uh in answer to that question before, Bryce, he actually had up on his laptop the sum, I believe it was 752 divided by 613 was my example of a static problem. And off the top of my head over the break, like they asked me again, and it was it's <laughs> 1.22675367407 recurring. Recurring. <laughs> so. It's actually 7047, yeah. mate. That's it. Like <laughs> could, ah, I forgot to add the one. Yeah, you always carry the one. <laughs> That's it. Like we're talking about like problem solving and... The sport, the sport of jiu-jitsu in itself. And you, you touched on earlier that you'd gone to the 2016 Hicks and Gracie Cup in Japan for a, for a tournament. Uh, break it down for, for us how a jiu-jitsu tournament works. How many matches did you have? Do, do you cut weight for the tournaments and th- that type of stuff? Um, so I don't, I don't cut weight as such because it's a same-day weigh-in. So you basically right. walk, walk on step on the scales and then you're in into your match within right. like half an hour. So I, I did cut for my very, very first competition, like a couple of kilos and it was really silly because I felt it like by the end of the, the first round, I was just like gassed, so gassed. So from that point on, I was like, all right, I need to be at whatever weight that I'm going to step onto the mat at like bef- you know while i'm training so i'm not worried about any weight cutting or anything like that it's not like sort of mma where you yeah but um the format of the the actual tournaments is it's a sort of elimination you come up against in in my bracket there was eight eight guys so it was two fights to win uh the the gold um the first guy i submitted with a bow and arrow choke in probably like the last minute and that the, sounds cool as fuck. Yeah, it's essentially so you you take the guys back, um, and on the geese, the the actual the the, ne- the the part that's around your neck is called the lapel. So you take the the part that's well, it's it's really hard to explain for people just listening. But it's like, it's like a stiff fabric around the neck of the. It's like a big collar. As yeah. Such. If you can just imagine a collar on a big uh, on a lapel, dressing on a dressing of gown. A jacket. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 So basically, I'm you know on the guy's back and using that around his neck to choke him out and yeah so i used that I, I won the first fight by bow and arrow choke and then uh the second the second fight i went to points and be- just beat the guy uh really tough opponent japanese both japanese cool, guys cool, yeah cool. yeah cool. both japanese guys um and both had been training for approximately you know a year and a half two years so a little you know around about the same time as me a little bit longer but both you know really tough guys and just the the atmosphere of because it was in it was in a, a, you know a, quite a big arena arena Chiba Sports Arena in in just outside of Tokyo, and um, yeah it was it was awesome to be there. There was a couple of um, like celebrities there in uh, Huffer and Guy Mendes who have won the the world championships you know four and six times respectively. Um, got to meet Hickson there. He was there for the ceremony and you know. Got my got my gold medal, got up on the podium, and then because you know Jason is is a student under Hickson, we sort of got the VIP back entrance. Like as I'm walking off the podium with my gold medal, getting photos and stuff, Jason's like, "Come on, mate! Like we're going backstage to meet Hickson. Like go back, go backstage, and it's just our just access. Like no one else got this privilege. Just walk back there, and with my gi on, still sweaty from the match, with my gold medal wrapped around my neck." walk up and Hickson's like, oh man, you know, or like I, I still can't even remember what he said to me because it, I was so flustered that he was actually like shaking my hand and this guy was like, you know, congratulations, like well done, You, I see this gold medal, you'll be a champion, like it was just like, holy star strike. Uh, yeah, a, man, a man like that, it's similar to what the Vandalay thing I said earlier, when you're looking up to someone like that and you do meet them, that they, they have an aura oh, about them. Big time. It, it was that's what I could describe it as is an aura. It was just like and I and yeah, I don't know if, if you would if if someone who didn't know who what you know, didn't know anything about jujitsu, I think they would still look at this guy and still be like, Man, there's something this about This guy's gotta be this, somebody. There's yeah, something yeah. about this guy. Yeah, I think, you know, even with like celebrities and stuff, they'd be like 
there's something about that that human that's different from everyone else you yeah know I mean? whether it's the way they look or if you want to get deeper like you, the energy that you can sense yeah. around people like I, I i'm a firm believer in that shit like if somebody's pissed off at you in a room you can feel that you can definitely feel it 100%, yeah. yeah yeah and so like you can tell when people are a formidable character like a formidable human beings walking past you like oh shit i'm feeling some fucking vibrations coming off this motherfucker and especially in that in your instance with meeting a guy like him having like him giving you a rap as well? Yeah. At the same time? Yeah, like, hang yeah. on. How old would Hanzo be now? Uh, Hickson. Hickson. Hickson, he is 58. 58. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I got the privilege of actually staying in Japan a week after the competition and he was holding a seminar. And um, so he... So to break down a seminar for jiu-jitsu is like he basically three hours of guys showing you techniques but when you like for for hickson he goes back to the basics like shows you the fundamentals and he tries to get into that uh connection that he talks about of like okay this is a a fundamental theory that you can apply to any technique that you do so whether you're doing you know x uh you know x guard butterfly sweeps if you're on the on your back standing up this if you have this theory of this connection, you can apply it wherever you go. It's not just in jujitsu. You know, if you're picking up a, a bag of groceries, you can, you know, you, that's essentially, it's that, uh, what's the word I'm trying to look for is, um, just choking out your groceries. Cho- when you're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> strangling your cucumber. <laughs> you got I've your uh, nutsack on your fucking laptop again there. Dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally yeah. lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 it translates into all of life's little things, like not just athletics. Mm. Mm. Yeah, And I guess it's such a hard thing to try and explain to people who aren't in that loop, you know, who aren't studying this stuff. Like you're only, you know, at, at knee deep level and yeah. it's like, and it's, there's so much that, that you're finding out and that it is difficult for you to communicate. 100%. Once you get to the, you know, the Hicks and Gracie level, you're, you're fucking definitely neck deep. And, um, and you know, you've got that, that crazy fucking knowledge that you could never describe to somebody. It's like, yeah. that's just this innate like thing that you've got. Like, I can't teach this to you. Well, I can't it, teach this to you. This is who I am. There's, like, there's something outside of like, going back to like that sort of human that he is, is like, um, I've heard Jason, he, Jason refers to him all the time when we're doing techniques and stuff like this. And he started doing yoga when he was like um, in his 30s, I think. And he was always into like breathing and like you would have seen well, that like, doco choke. Yeah. Have, yeah. You, have you seen it? I've like, seen like parts of it on YouTube. It's pretty old grainy black and white yeah, doco. Yeah, yeah. But this guy like Hicks and Gracie like would have been in his 20s in the video. He, well, he was actually in his late 30s. In his late 30s. In, when that looks, documentary looks was Looks like made. he's in his 30s. Yeah. He's doing all these crazy sort of like stomach vacuum breathing techniques. Diaphra- and then, diaphragmatic and then Thing. you know can can do the yoga pose where he's standing on one foot and the other foot is at a complete vertical you know upright yeah. above his head just crazy dexterity of limbs and that long ago too like doing yoga yeah. before it was I'm, cool I'm yeah sh- before i'm it was sure cool. he would be fucking more mobile than me and you put together bris Not like me man at, <laughs> at pushing 60 rubber man well <laughs> going back to that jason said that his, the guy that was teaching him the, the breathing stuff and the yoga and uh, basically he conquered it within six months. The guy that was showing him, you know, all, showing him how to do these things was like, I can't teach you anymore. You know, you've mastered this. Like, well, well, it just, yeah. it just, it just goes back to the kind of like human that he is. He's just has this different brain that works differently from everyone else. Kind of like a maths prodigy that just is, you know, a freak that a whiz, no, yeah. You're a whiz. He's like, yeah, you know, he's a computer you know? whiz. He's a mathematician. Exactly, like he can apply his brain to doing that type of thing, it's and so yeah. much better than everyone else. Isn't it crazy how like uh, it's it, the spread of people uh, of human beings basically, and the different little things that they happen to be experts at? Like some people just naturally gravitate towards, you know, you might be a fucking unbelievable knife maker, or you might be, you know, a great singer, or 
everybody has these weird like individual unique talents and and some people become these these masters of their own specific little thing about being a human and it's fucking i, I think i love seeing that in whatever field exactly it's in. what exactly. if it, like it is if it's, it's inspiring if it's singing yeah. if you hear someone really at the you know freak level of singing you're like you feel inspired if you see someone make something really beautiful like a you know, some awesome woodwork or something, you're like, man, that's awesome. You can see the beauty that's gone into it. So I think the appreciation extends outside of people in that inner circle yeah. and those people, whatever their craft is. For, is an, for any sort of mastery, that's a really good point actually too, where you can admire and appreciate anyone that has elite skill in yeah. anything. And this is like, this is essentially like we, uh, we tag our podcast sports and recreation and that's essentially what this podcast is. But all of the sport that we're interested in is people at their absolute peak and and performance level and and discussing those things that's what that's what holds your interest you know and testing themselves and it's like and and that not only is is um exclusive to sport it just it translates throughout the entirety of life and and I think that's why you know that's why you do have interest in these things because they hold your interest they're fascinating and and it's and it's that's what it's like when you you know are in the presence of somebody that's fucking a master or something and it's like you can sense that and it's fucking that's one of the most beautiful things about life for sure definitely like i I remember when i first won the ibo middleweight boxing title (laughs) 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 i realized i made it i was was 14 years old and then i woke up (laughs) my my sport in terms of what I'm looking to master is golf. And that's an, another sort of indiv- individual sport to the point where even the elite level guys are always constantly learning and adjusting. Yeah. And there's different things to that. So I can definitely appreciate like, the, the journey that people are on in martial arts. It's, um, it, it's just crazy what different paths that people choose to I- invest their time and, and money in as mm. well too mm. because that's it it's all some just people, getting better some people sell second hand art door to door on uh, on Friday <laughs> <Yeah>. nights <laughs> <laughs> haven't seen him since but it's a surprise, surprise. <laughs> in, uh, in one of our earlier episodes we had somebody interrupt a podcast midway through to to sell a painting that they'd found on the street uh, so <laughs> Alleg- you don't know that he found that on the street. He could have made it that. It just happened to be curbside collection <laughs> <laughs> at the time too, man. I heard the episode, mate. Straight, <sighs> cr- straight crackhead. Like. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. No. Do you want to buy this painting? No. Yeah. Cool. Can you give me 20 bucks anyway? <laughs> <laughs> what a tr- yeah, a- absolute fucking trip. There's been so, a, um, a couple of mornings this week on my commute into work. There's been um, this homeless guy that I haven't seen before sitting in one of the tunnels um, coming out of the train and uh begging for change and stuff like that but looks like just severely fucking drug addicted but obviously hasn't bathed in a while this morning he had his pants down around his like knees basically and was just sitting bare ass on on the tunnel wall and everybody was just doing a big sort of around walking around him and it's just like you know you talk about people at the fucking mastery level of yeah. life and then there's there's people at the other end yeah. of life and it's like holy fuck man how did you get so fucked up man you're not that you know much much older or younger than me like we're or basically the same or, yeah. yeah core elements where we're, we're of, the same couple of couple of choices away from you know taking that turn or choices yeah yeah, yeah. i've seen the guys dance referring to and just the look in this guy's eye, man. He, he's not all there and just oh, on loop every sort of three to four seconds when it's a morning commute with thousands of people quite literally passing by this guy and just on five second repeat, just got any change, got any change, got any change, like got any change over and over again. It's just, it's a reality check at that time. Like seeing that at 20 past seven in the morning when you're walking past, when you're off to try and like ma- make a buck and stay afloat. You're other, other people about going yeah. to work that day. You're yeah. like, fuck, I don't really want to go to work yeah. today. But then you're like, oh, man, yeah. I mean, there's fun. a few guys I see around the city. There's one who is like, I mean, I'm completely comfortable with my sexuality to say he's not actually a bad looking bloke. If you gave this guy a shave and a shower and stuff like that, he's like, you know, our age and Scrub up. about 30 years old. Looks looks fairly. He's not overweight. He looks in good shape and all that sort of stuff. But 
a radius of, I want to say, 15, 20 metres around him. You can smell him coming, man. Strongest fucking smell ever. And I'm like, dude, why don't you go home and have a fucking shower? Like, I, I, Obviously, that's an ignorant thing to say if you don't have a home and people have all kinds of mental health circumstances and stuff like that that causes them to, to a lot of the times, choose to be homeless. There's a, a quote that um that i heard when i was like a teenager that always stuck with me that um being homeless is not necessarily being houseless a lot of people choose to be homeless and it's like that shit's out there you know it's just fucking yeah it's and it's like that's that's the opposite end of the spectrum and then you've got everything in between yeah Got that solid mediocre range. Normally that's where I'm at. <laughs> that's dog. where I'm at. <laughs> the thing, the thing that, yeah, Love yeah. me some mediocre. <laughs> like, hit me with that middle ground, baby. Yeah. I'm like, in the mean. Yeah, the shit's like, not too extreme here like, in the middle, boys. Doing, that's that's, doing yeah. stats this semester at uni, so I the know what the mean means. The status quo, like walking down the tunnel at that time of the morning, though, it, it only caught me off guard because I swear to the listeners, it's a tunnel, the best part of how long you reckon it is, Danny? 80 meters or something? Yeah. When you walk out of the tunnel. 80% of the time when I'm doing it, it's a UFC walkout simulation <laughs> that I'm doing. With a song, but with there's the never any crowd when you come out of the tunnel. <laughs> it's no, just garden. No, you, you visualise it. It's all the about the sound. The crowd, right? It's yeah. all about the sound. The, yeah, yeah. the, first, the first time I heard you guys describe this, I was like, I've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone who's oh, yeah. a fight fan has done yeah, this. You have, absolutely. Like walking down the tunnel with that in there. And like, and I even envisage like walking like, and raising my arms above my head and shit as I walk out a la McGregor. Like, yeah. Just coming out with, with the, flag the flag draped over well you, you know like you know what i used to do as a kid i remember i started learning the guitar when i was 10 years old and uh my guitar teacher used to say uh it doesn't cost you anything to dream so like dream as much as you want sort of thing and um Some deep shit so so he he'd like <laughs> encourage like you know jumping around in the room with your tennis racket and shit like that you know pretending you could play and uh and so i fucking used to i, love that. I, <laughs> I used I, to I get that. But yeah. I used to get super yeah. embarrassed, bro, because I would be in my room with Metallica playing and have the tennis racket out and I would be visualizing tens of fucking thousands of people just listening to me soloing out. Yeah. And then next thing, like, mum and dad will come in, come in to, <laughs> to tell me dinner's ready and I'd be mortified, man. Oh, it was just no. like... <laughs> dare, dare to dream. Dare to dream. I was just dare to dream, to, listeners. Yeah. That's like... To yeah. every, everyone has envisages of that, like, if that's even a word, envisages... <laughs> Envisage. In, envisage. It always trips me up yeah. that word. It's envisage. a shit word. Envisage. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something that's like maybe lost in today's like younger society is you know just just do it like just dream and if you've got a dream don't don't like beat it down with a stick because if you were yeah. like yeah you know. and that's the thing like it's it, like me being embarrassed as a fucking 10 year old is basically self-doubt and that's what human beings yeah. constantly have we constantly dream and have all this ambition and shit but we're constantly racked with self-doubt and we're like uh we're always our own worst enemy in that sense big, and i big, think big time. If, if you if you speak to people that are trying to get things done and that are trying to achieve things or whatever it's a constant battle to conquer self-doubt and i think um that's you know if you can rationalize that and see it as just your own head noise and it's it's really just you holding yourself back by doing that that's yeah. that's part of you know achieving your dreams and 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 shooting for shit or whatever but yeah that's self doubt's a have, motherfucker man do you have like talking about dreams and ambitions and you've obviously found your passion do you have dreams of becoming a black belt do you have intentions man. to stick into the craft 100 percent. yeah that's that's definitely I think I've like man. I, when I was doing gymnastics at at a younger age, I lo I absolutely loved training. I loved going there and learning new things and progressing. Um, and then I think that same passion I found in in jujitsu, and I think it's something that you can carry forth forever. Like I think I you know you don't have to be the the you know Michael Phelps or Usain Bolt looking stud to be you know in your to still be practicing jujitsu, and that's the beautiful thing about it. Like Hickson's like fifty-eight, and you got all these old guys, and they're still rolling around the mats, and they're still able to apply that. And I think it's something that you will never ever stop learning. And I definitely, you know, that that black belt thing is a lot of things that people say. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get that one day, but it's a lot longer journey than people envisage. Mm. 
In, is that word again? Nailed it. <laughs> no, you <laughs> Did defi- I? definitely got Did it I better than me. Yeah, you made it, you bitch. Invis- yeah. Envisage. Yeah. 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 I'm you, not going to try and say it again. You though. tapped it out. <laughs> Just <laughs> keeping with the jujitsu thing. But uh, no, but um, I, I, I definitely. That's a long term thing. Um, for me, while I'm still white belt, I, I have had talking about dreams. Um, that I want to do. I want to go to world championships as a white belt, and I think it's. In the pool of white belt, like before you start progressing into blues and purples and browns and blacks, white belt is probably the stage at which you have, or I feel, you have the most chance to do it as as a, it. as a novice. Yep. Like so, yeah, right do it now while I can. Then once you get the you know once you get to the next stage of blue, it's like the pool gets so much deeper. Yeah. So it's like, you know, why not try? It? Why the, not do it? The example that I can give from my sport that's similar to that now, I've started to play competition golf. Nice. And getting into golf with a high handicap, if you're I'm playing in D grade against all people with a similar skill level to me. Yes. So that's in against my grade. If I go out and play well and a little bit better than my ability, if you rise to the occasion, say you would in like the final of a Hicks and Gracie Cup or a World. Yeah. You lift to that level and you can win D grade. Yeah, that's like winning the white belt. Yeah, level. So yeah, yeah. That, I, I can definitely relate to what you said. Yeah, and I think whatever your goal is, if whatever your goal is, if you put a plan in place and kick all like you know, okay, look, I'm gonna train for such and such time for eight weeks leading up to this competition. I'm gonna have my diet right. I'm gonna get all my you know mental prep and everything, and then you do that. Whether you win or lose, you've gone through that stage of putting your body and your mind through this this like tr- like period where you've applied everything that you've got and you see that you have you know capabilities beyond what you thought you did so whether you you know get you know win by submission or you know don't don't win whatever you come out on the other side and you go man like i did i, I did all the training i did everything like that's better than what i was doing before i even you know stepped on the mat you know and a lot of that they people talk about in jiu-jitsu is like it the the biggest step is actually going to start is is the biggest step and yeah. then you know so actually having the courage to be like no yeah. I, I can do that I, you know so a lot of people have I, I thought about it for years before i even even tried to you know, walk through that doors of the academy and and then now I'm like, man, I wish I'd started a couple of years yeah, earlier. Man, <laughs> de- most definitely was like, yeah. oh shit. Yeah. I mean, like, if I could got stuck into this from when I was 18, yeah. I'd be, w- you'd probably be at that sort of like hot brown level. Like yeah. Potentially, oh, you know I what mean, I mean? Like, dead a dream. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, fucking oath. Like, yeah, well, I think that's a uh, a beautiful way to uh, to bring this bad boy home. It's been a, an absolute pleasure to have you on, dude. Fucking no Always doubt guys. we'll be uh, we'll be seeing and hearing from you again. You could, but, e- uh, you could easily come on as a return return guest, like where you're heading down the sports psychology path in your sort of personal life as well, I believe. So yeah, we'd love to get you on again to be able to pick your brain on that side of things. Definitely, and man. You're only you're only uh, stones throw away down the road, so fuck just it. hope the traffic isn't too bad. <laughs> yeah, that's it. maybe ca- yeah. maybe catch the train. We'll pick you up. It's handy. Yeah, yeah. Fairly handy to the studio. So yeah. we'll break it down once you get here, anyway, though. But. Um, Yeah, anyway, I think we'll be back sometime next week. But till then, take care of each other. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys.